My name is Dr. Eamon Mahoney. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon practicing here at Northern Arizona Orthopedics and Flagstaff. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Luckily, you didn't have to drive here because it's currently snowing here in Flagstaff. So a little bit, a little bit about myself. I was born in Queens, uh, New York City, and that's basically my excuse for everything. Um, I went to I moved around a bit, lived in Buffalo, New York, and then my father who worked for the Justice Department moved us to France and I lived in France for three years finishing high school. I then finished, went to college at Fordham University in New York City. I continued my education at New York University School of Medicine and then did my residency in, at Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. I then came across the, the country and went, came to California and did my fellowship in San Francisco it was there that I wished, decided to stay on the West Coast and I began my practice down in Los Angeles in the Long Beach area. And then five years ago, we moved here to Flagstaff with my family. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter and I'm married to my wife, Susie. So enough about myself. Now, spine fusions, everybody is, whenever I see patients in my office and they come in and I mention the F word, they most people are not happy. They are very afraid of spine fusions. Um, and for some, some occasions, yes, that's rightfully so. Um, there's, you know, spine fusions have come a long way since the, since the beginning. Um, and I'm trying, I'm here to try to dispel that myth and that bad association. Um, I think spine fusions can be very helpful in certain circumstances. And uh, not everybody is a candidate for spine fusion, but plenty of people are, and it can be very helpful when they are. So what is a spine fusion? A spine fusion is a joining of two or more vertebrae in the spine. So this, the, the spine is made up of multiple vertebrae. There's seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae, and then we go into the sacrum. Um, so in the spine, we, we confuse one or more vertebrae, um, any joint in the body can be fused. And the vertebrae are basically joints. Um, and traditionally in, in the orthopedics, we fuse different joints, like joints in the fingers or the, the toes or feet, ankle fusions are common. Um, before joint replacements for the hip or knee, that, was, that would happen for pain and other indications. Um, and the spine, we've been, the spine has been, um, we've been doing spine fusions for quite a, quite a few decades now. Um, and the idea of a fusion is trying to get bone to grow between the joints. So you destroy the cartilage um, and try to get bone to grow between across the joint space and fusing that those two bones together. Um, so if, if a, jo a moving segment, a joint is creating pain, that pain is going to continue until we, we fuse that joint. And it, actually, if you look at old skeletons, and I remember taking a trip to the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, there's a lot of skeletons of different mammals um, and the body fuses its own joints. And that's what bone spurs are for. They, bone, spur, bone spurs grow to try to stiffen up a joint and eventually fuse that joint. So people will often fuse their own spines. Um, and we have a term for that, it's called ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and sometimes it can be a disease where it's almost an, a, an immune reaction and the body fuses the, the vertebrae together. But we see that in those, in the tar pits, animals that probably from injuries, they, uh, the, the spine will actually fuse itself and uh, prevent motion at that moving segment. So what are non-surgical options for pain? So there's two different, I usually try to make um, group pain in the back into two different categories. One is axial pain. So neck and back pain in the axial skeleton. So basically my neck hurts, it's in the neck or my back hurts, it's right in the back versus radicular pain, which people call sciatica for the legs. Um, you can have a sciatica type or a radicular type of pain in the arm from the neck. Um, and the reason why I like to separate those two is because it's usually two separate uh, causes or origins for that pain. A radicular or sciatica type pain is usually a nerve impingement, while the axial pain is usually more of a mechanical pain, so a degenerative disc disease or a degenerative joint in the back. Um, my first go-to for almost all my patients or any patient that hasn't had it is physical therapy. And some people ask why? Well, because it works. Um, physical therapy can be very helpful for people, especially with axial pain, um, mechanical pain. And the whole idea of 
physical therapy for axial pain is to try to get the muscles working better for the spine to support the skeleton and the skeletal system. Um, and the muscles are highly uh, intimate with the skeleton in the spine. And it's a very complicated uh, situation in, for the anatomy. And it can be very helpful if we can strengthen those muscles and get them working better for people. And it can cure a lot of back pain. Um, so it's a good way to avoid me, the surgeon, um, is physical therapy. Other things in the realm of physical therapy, massage, acupuncture, and even chiropractor can be helpful. Um, another step is activity modification. So avoiding the things that hurt. Um, easy said, um, sometimes harder to do. Medications, uh, I often like to see people taking Advil or Aleve, uh, anti-inflammatories that can be helpful if it's possible. And then finally, injections. Um, oftentimes I'll recommend epidural injections or facet injections. Facet injections, the facets are the, the joints in the back of the spine. So at each level, there's two joints, on, one on each side, and those are called facets. Um, and sometimes we'll inject steroid into those joints or and then sometimes we'll block the nerves that go to the joint. And if that works, we can burn those nerves with a special needle and that's called a rhizotomy or neurotomy. And that can be very helpful for treating people's axial back pain. Um, so those are all good options for trying to avoid surgery. Surgical options. So when I, the reason why I like to group the axial pain and the radicular pain into two different categories is because oftentimes there's different operations for each of those categories. So a laminectomy or decompression is a an operation where we kind of clean out the, the space for the nerves. So try to unpinch the nerves. And if people are having sciatica pain from a, a disc herniation, you can see the disc um, in that picture of the vertebrae there. If the disc is punching out and pinching the, the nerves, which are the yellow things in the picture, that can create a, a bad sciatica pain. And it's possible to go in there and clean out that disc that's pinching the nerve and not have to do any fusions. Oftentimes in a degenerative spine, um, degenerative meaning as we get older, we'll get something called stenosis or tightness on the nerves and that can lead to something called neurogenic claudication. So neurogenic claudication means uh, nerve pain when you start walking. So a lot of times people will start getting pain when they walk and then when they sit down it gets better or if they lean forward, it gets better. Um, there's something called a shopping cart sign. So people use a shopping cart and they lean over it and their legs don't hurt when they walk like that. And it's oftentimes because there's tightness on the nerve centrally. So if you look at that picture, there's a, uh, the arrow that points to vertebral bone growth. Um, that bone, that growth is pushing up on the nerves and creating that stenosis. And we can go in there and clean that, that tissue out and not have to do a fusion and oftentimes treat that pain. And it can be a very successful sort of easy operation. That, it's more common to do that kind of operation in the lumbar spine. In the cervical spine, we do do decompressions and they come in two forms, uh, laminectomies versus laminoplasty. And a laminoplasty is where we kind of unhinge the roof of the spine and open it up and we can uh, create a little block or a doorstop so it doesn't close back down. And the benefit of that is we can keep the posterior or the, the posterior skeleton intact and it can be helpful for pain. And then finally, spine fusions. Sometimes we do have to do spine fusions um, and it can be a single segment or multiple segments. So on to the spine fusion. So why would we do a fusion? Well, there's a couple of different reasons uh, for spine fusions. One is the classic reason is to correct a deformity in the spine. Um, and that's probably where spine fusion really started out. Actually in history, tuberculosis often affected the spine and that's where a lot of advancements in spine surgery came from is actually is treating tuberculosis because it became a major issue um, in the in the uh, mid 20th century. So correcting scoliosis, um, the picture on the upper right, you can see that this, this x rays of, of spine with a pretty severe scoliosis and post operatively with all the screws and the rods, the, the scoliosis has been corrected and it's now straight and it's pretty amazing what we can do these days um, in, in correcting this. Uh, idiopathic scoliosis, meaning scoliosis in children. Um, so typically when you have a picture like that on the upper right, it's usually in a teenager or uh, early, a young adult um, where we have a very flexible deformity that we can correct that um, spine pretty nicely. Adult deformity is usually a degenerative process and the spine is much stiffer might not get as much correction, but it still can be very helpful to treat that the pain associated with that deformity. Um, so we can have a degenerative scoliosis or a degenerative kyphosis, um, and we can have 
pretty powerful operations to treat that. A spondylolisthesis, which is a fancy term for slipped vertebrae. So the picture on the, the second picture, um, the one that's a little bit lower down, that's a spondylolisthesis of L5S1 of the bottom of the lumbar spine. And that can be a pretty painful, uh, uh, pretty painful condition. There can be nerve impingement associated with that. And the, the slippage itself can be painful. However, it doesn't have to be painful. A lot of people will have a spondylolisthesis and not even know it for decades and they do just fine. But a fusion can be a good operation to treat that problem. Um, fractures, sometimes we'll treat fractures, especially in a traumatic situation um, with, with fusions. Now, as people get older and their bones get weaker, a lot of people develop fractures of the spine called compression fractures. And oftentimes we won't treat those with fusions um, or any in surgical indication. Um, we'll just let them get better on their own and they often will get better on their own. Sometimes we'll do fusions to allow us to do better decompression of the nerves. So sometimes we can't get a good enough decompression with just uh, a laminectomy, which is that smaller operation I talked about before. And we do need to do a bigger uh, decompression. And when we do a big decompression, sometimes we'll disrupt the joints. And then if we disrupt the joints, we'll have to do a fusion to stabilize that segment. And those are, those are the main indications for fusions. Obviously there's gonna be more indications than this, but I wanted to go over, briefly touch on the, the reasons why we would do um, fusions. So how is a fusion obtained? A fusion is obtained by allowing bone to grow between the two vertebrae. So sometimes we'll take out the disc and put bone graft in where the disc was. Um, and the bone graft will oftentimes come from the patient itself, but also we'll use cadaveric bone graft, which is highly processed bone. And it allows for the, for the patient's own bone to grow into the it's into the bone, it sort of forms a matrix for that bone to grow and allows for the bone to grow between the two segments. The bone fusion is the same premise as healing a fracture. So I often describe it as if, if you have a broken bone, the, the body tries to heal that broken bone and they try to, the bone will grow new bone across that fracture gap. So a fusion is basically growing bone across that gap, which is, and we try to trick the body into thinking that there's a fracture and then it'll send out its own molecules and uh, signals to, to grow new bone. And that's, and that's the idea. The bone graft is often just a, a kind of a matrix for it to grow through and gives it a scaffolding for it to grow. Um, in any fusion, be it fractures or spine fusions, motion is the enemy. So we've been putting people in, you know, someone breaks a, a bone, we put them in a cast. And the reason for the cast is so the bone doesn't move. And that's been going on for centuries. Um, plaster of Paris, and now we use fiberglass. Um, as surgery got more advanced, we started using plates and screws to hold bones together, and that would be, give us a tighter fit. Um, we also use rods, of course, but the, the premise is the same in the spine. Uh, we, we, don't want, we don't want motion. Motion is bad for the bone to grow. So back in the early days of spine surgery, when we didn't have any hardware to put in to hold things in together, we would put people in braces and put them in casts. And oftentimes it would involve several months of bed rest, which would be pretty brutal. Um, no one wants to stay in bed for three months while their, their spine surgery heals. The, um, and a body cast, that sounds awful um, and miserable. And I don't know how people would do that or could have done that. And I can only imagine, luckily, I don't live in those times anymore. Um, nowadays, we use screws and rods um, to hold the bone together and hold th keep things from moving. Um, and it's the same kind of premise as what, when we fix fractures and long bones, um, having two motion segments kind of locked in together with those screws and rods. And this enables us to get people moving faster. Um, it's a very strong way to, to stop the motion um, it's, it's much better than any kind of brace we could ever use. So it can be very, a, a powerful way to help with, help gain that fusion. So this is a, some examples of those screws and rods I was talking about. So the picture on the left, those are Harrington rods. And so that's the first kind of instrumentation for the spine that we had, uh, often used for, correct, uh, for treating scoliosis and um, pretty brutal. If you look at that picture, it's a huge rod um, bent into two, to uh, bent into two and attach the spine with wires. Um, luckily, we do not use those anymore. Um, the pedicle screw or the screws for the spine start 
started to develop probably in the 70s. And the Roy Camille plate, which you can see in the middle, um, was a plate and basically took Phillips head screws and put them into the spine. Um, it worked, but it was very difficult to do. Um, and then uh, Dr. Steffi developed the screw on the, in the middle on the right. Um, and that was a step that's called a Steffi plate. And the x-ray there, you can see the x-ray. Um, the, those screws are pretty stable and basically screws with nuts and bolts um, attached to that plate. The plate gave the surgeon more leeway in where to place the screws, but it was still a very stiff construct and very difficult to put in, um, huge exposures and um, very time consuming. The, the screw on the right with the rod sticking through it is a more of a modern screw. Um, you can, it's very advanced, it's titanium and it's got dual pitch for the threads because there's different types of bone. We'll see a picture of that in, in the next slide. And then there's a tulip that holds the rod and there's a, a screw, a set screw that holds the rod down to the tulip and locks that screw into place. The nice thing about those screws is that that tool has, is polyaxial, it can move around and it gives the surgeon a lot more flexibility on where he can, where he or she needs to place that screw. And it, it, it's a very uh, powerful technique. So this is more about the screws and rods. Um, so the, you can see a, the, a picture of the screw itself with the tulip um, and then the rod. And the picture in the middle shows a, 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 a skeleton model with the, the screws, three screws on each side and a rod connecting those screws. So that's a two level fusion. Um, and you can see how that screw goes through that quarter of bone just below it. So the, the screw in the, the picture on the upper right is, an, is the old, not an old, I, won't, I don't wanna say old, but the traditional technique of placing those screws, they're called pedicle screws. So that, that bone that connects the front oval to the back is called the pedicle and the screw would go through the pedicle and get up into the vertebral body. Um, now the picture on the bottom right is a picture of the, the, the screw on the left is more of a modern technique. It's called a cortical screw. So the screw, a little bit shorter, but it avoids more, um, the, avoids the spinal canal better. It also gets better, harder bone. So you can see that bone where that arrow is and it's thick and white. Um, while the bone in the middle is kind of a lattice structure and that's called cancellous bone, it can be pretty weak. So by grabbing that thick white bone, that screw is a lot more powerful and a lot stronger. It also allows us to put those screws in a much smaller incision. So if you look at the screw on the right side, it, the angle goes from the outside to the in, and that, uh, that requires a much larger incision and dissection, while the screw on the left side is, it goes from the inside out and it allows us to keep the incision nice and small and it, and it allows us to have the exposure much more minimal to get those same screws in. So anterior inner body fusions is a different technique. We don't use those pedicle screws, but we put a, um, a cage or a spacer in where the disc was. And you can see that on the picture on the right is a picture of the dissection for the an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. And we'll get that exposure and then take the disc out and then put a spacer in and then usually put a plate and screws on top of that. Um, the incision for it in ACDF, you can see on this patient on the left is quite small. This patient is, it's uh, fairly a fresh incision. So it's gonna heal up much nicer than it is now. Um, and it's pretty small incision to get the exposure you see on the right. The lumbar inner body fusion is a, an operation we do for the, the bottom of the spine, the lumbar spine. Um, the incision is usually a vertical incision, but it can be a horizontal incision as you see on the right. Um, and it's usually not very big, especially if it's just a one level fusion. The picture on the left is showing you the, what the cage looks like. Um, it's a titanium cage um, and the screws go through the cage and then go into the bone. And you can see the, the model on the right, there's a, the, the cage is an oval shape and it almost fills up the whole disc space. Um, it's a nice big inner body cage and, and that's important for bone graft and getting a good fusion mass. So let's go on to the myths of spine fusion surgery. One, the most common myth probably that I hear, the most, con the most common concern I hear from patients after I recommend a fusion is, am I gonna lose uh, motion? How much motion am I gonna lose? Am I gonna be able to move? So it's a very real fear of patients and it's a, not necessarily a founded fear. Um, in cervical fusions, we know that 
For each level that we fuse, people lose about 10 degrees of normal motion. So what is 10 degrees of normal motion? So in a normal cervical spine, if we look left and right, right, you can look about 90 degrees to the side, up and down, about 40 degrees up and 80 degrees down. So 10 degrees of, of loss of motion. So instead of looking 90 degrees, you look about 80 degrees. Now, if you did a four level fusion, that's a lot of motion, that's 40 degrees. So 90 degrees will bring you to about 45 degrees and that's, you know, that's losing quite a bit. And that, that can be significant. However, with the one or two level fusion, which is most common, um, the, the loss of motion is usually pretty insignificant. And in fact, when people are having a lot of neck pain and we're treating that neck pain by locking up those levels, a lot of people will actually gain motion because they're no longer having pain and they were guarding their motion because it hurt. And so we take away that pain source and now they can move better, um, which is interesting. In the lumbar spine, we don't really expect people to lose much motion at all, especially if it's just a limited fusion of one or two levels, um, which is the most common uh, amount of levels that we do when we do a lumbar fusion, at least in my practice. Um, so when people ask about, when I, when I recommend surgery for the lumbar spine, and they ask how much motion they're, they're gonna lose, I usually tell them not much. And I have proof of this. Um, several patients have generously been uh, accepted to be photographed for this talk. Um, this is one of my patients who uh, had several fusions um, and she ended up with, with a three-level fusion in her lumbar spine. And those are her x-rays on the left. Um, and she can put her palms on the floor. I can't even put my palms on the floor and I've never had a spine fusion. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and then this gentleman here who is only, I think he's four to six months from surgery he had a one level of spine fusion and he's touching his toes. He's cheating a little bit, he's bending his knees, but that's okay. Um, but he, you know, you can look at his picture on the left. His preoperative picture was, a, he had a spondylolisthesis, a slippage of the vertebrae, um, was pretty miserable before surgery. And now he's touching his toes and he's quite happy um, four to six months after surgery. So that's myth number one. Myth number two. Spine fusion surgery is a huge operation. Well, it can be, um, but usually it's not. And especially in my practice, I tend to recommend smaller spine surgeries um, and they're usually not big, big operations. There's been a lot of advancement in, in spine surgery through the years. And I remember watching a video um, from a, a academic institution, Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. And one, one of the more famous spine surgeons in the country. Um, they were doing a video of a one level spine fusion. And the first thing they said is this operation cannot be done in a small incision. And they were making this incision that was huge. Um, and I, my jaw dropped um, because what I do now is one third of the size of that incision. And I just, and that was only in 2006. Um, and I just couldn't believe the amount, the, advancement that we've had even in the last 15 years um, has been incredible. So it doesn't have to be a huge operation. We don't need huge incisions. Um, there's minimal blood loss. Uh, in the past five years, I think I've given one transfusion um, for spines for all the surgeries I've done. Um, my average blood loss ranges from 25 milliliters to 150 milliliters. Um, a pint of blood is about 475 milliliters. Surgical time ranges anywhere from 45 minutes to several hours, um, usually about three to four hours. Um, but a lot of surgeries, especially those um, kind of a well-controlled uh, surgery can be pretty short and pretty, pretty done pretty nicely. Um, and then some sp spine fusions can be done as outpatients, especially anterior cervical discectomy infusions, that's the cervical fusion. Um, and then sometimes some A-lifts can be done as outpatients and those patients can go home that day. Um, so once again, you know, it doesn't require long hospital stays um, and it doesn't have to be a massive operation. So this is an L5S1 ALIF anterior lumbar and body fusion. I showed you that cage, that picture, that's the x-ray of a ca that cage. Um, that's what it looks like in, in the skeleton. Um, usually it's a 45 minute to one hour operation. 95% um, of the time people go home after one night in the hospital and it's about a two inch incision. Um, it's, it, and a lot can be done through that two inch incision. It's pretty amazing.
For cervical fusions, um, like I said, one to two level ACDFs can go home that day, depending on the patient, of course. Um, cervical collar is elective. I don't usually put people in collars after one or two level fusions. I usually give them collars for comfort. Um, there's minimal restrictions and uh, it can be done through a very small incision. The average hospital stay after a fusion is only usually only one to three days, um, one to two nights in the hospital and they, most people go home. And most people go home after, after my surgeries. Um, sometimes people will go to rehab or go to a nursing home, but the majority, meaning 90% of people will go home after, after that surgery. So that's nice. I, I, I try to avoid you know, long hospital stays and try to avoid having people go to a secondary facility um, because people want to be home. Myth number three, the post-operative course will be long and painful. So typically, um, I tell people that the first two weeks, yeah, there's going to be some pain. It doesn't tickle. Um, I, you know, we give people pain meds, um, but I hope to get people off those pain meds. Usually after those two weeks, the first two weeks, sometimes it's a little longer. Often, a lot of times people take only several days of pain meds. Um, I usually get people started physical with their physical therapy after six weeks. Um, for the cervical spine fusions, oftentimes people don't need physical therapy. Um, for the lumbar, I really would like people to do physical therapy because I think it's important to get their muscles strong again um, and working better for them. The restrictions are after a spine, the lumbar spine fusions, I don't want people doing a lot of repetitive bending and twisting and no heavy lifting for three months. So sometimes it can be dangerous because people are feeling really good after three or four weeks and they just wanna get back to what they weren't able to do before surgery, i.e. clean the garage or build that fence or it's usually guys because men typically tend to wanna to do dumber things than women. Um, but the, uh, and when they're feeling really good, they're like, I can do this, I don't have any problems. But they, they once again, remember that fusions require lack of motion and those screws are strong that we put in people but they will fail if there's too much motion. So I really want people to take it easy for three months, not do too much and let that bone heal so we can have a successful operation. However, I do love it when people walk. I want people up and moving and, and uh, oftentimes people come back and tell me they're walking two, three miles, even after only a few weeks and I love it. Um, and that's what I like to see. Common myth number four, I'm too old for fusion surgery. Well, that's not true. Um, I don't, age isn't really a category for me. It's more of health. Um, you might tell me I'm too unhealthy for spine fusion surgery, and that might be true. But age, I'm not, I don't get too worked up about age. I think it's really important to keep people moving. And if people can't walk because they have too much pain, then that can be much more dangerous than having a, a simple spine fusion or simple spine surgery. Um, so that's my argument to a lot of people. The average age of my patients that have surgery is probably around 65, uh, maybe even a little bit older. So um, I, don't, I don't like that argument. I don't like that saying I'm too old for spine surgery. I don't think that's true. I want to get people up and walking and moving. I think that's really important for their health. All patients, common myth number five, all patients who have fusion surgery are worse afterwards. And I hear this a lot. Um, why is that? Well, I don't know. I think people remember their uncle Joe who had spine fusion surgery 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and they did worse. And like I said, spine surgery's come a long way. Um, I think more people, surgeons weren't as well trained back in the nineties and they were doing spine surgery. So a lot of general orthopedists were doing spine surgery and spine surgery is pretty complicated and it's really important to be fellowship trained in, in spine surgery to have good outcomes. I'm not saying general orthopedists can't do spine surgery, but I, I just think it, it helps with outcomes. Um, advancements in technology has helped a lot. Um, also, I think patient selection is very important for a good outcome. So some people get spine surgery, they really shouldn't have had spine surgery. Um, they didn't have good indications for that surgery and they were offered that surgery anyway. Um, and if you don't have a good indication for surgery, your outcomes are probably aren't gonna be good. Um, my, um, worst nightmare is making someone worse after surgery. 
Um, I am fully indebted to my patients that I operate on. And if I have a patient that is doing worse, it, it's bad for them. It's also, it's bad for me. I don't like that. Um, and so I try to make sure my indications are, you know, the patients have good indications for surgery because I think that's the best way to have a good outcome after surgery. Um, it's also important to have reasonable expectations from that surgery. You know, if someone has pain from head to toe and we're operating on one spot, it's not very reasonable to think that the pain from head to toe is going to get better from a surgery um, that addresses only one spot of the spine. And this is just a quote from a patient of mine, um, just to prove that I have um, patients that do much better after surgery. This is a patient who had a pretty large operation, four level fusion, um, and she wrote me this card six weeks after surgery. And, you know, there, are, Dr. Mahoney, there are no words I can say to describe the gratitude I have for what you gave me, and that's my life back. So, um, powerful surgery can be, have a powerful impact on people in a very positive way. Coming with number five, once again, uh, people do get better. They, I had a patient who was a cowboy. He, he broke horses for a living. Um, he had a two level lumbar fusion and went back to breaking horses again. And I can't imagine that's an easy job. Um, I've had truck drivers driving FedEx trucks. Um, I remember one, one gentleman who I did a L5 S1 fusion, um, anterior lumbar and body fusion, and he had to get back to work after six weeks. It wasn't really what I wanted, but he did. Um, he did great. He was very happy, um, driving a truck and driving trucks, is not easy. Um, long hours sitting in a seat, bumpy roads, um, bad drivers out there. So it's not an easy job. And he was able to successfully get back to work pretty quickly. Um, so one, one myth, someone might not be able to get back to playing NFL football and win the Super Bowl after fusion surgery. Well, that's wrong because Peyton Manning had a, um, after he actually had several surgeries on his neck some of which were very small surgeries to try to fix his right arm pain. And they were unsuccessful. He ultimately ended up with a cervical fusion. Um, and I, I think a year or two years after having that cervical fusion, he went back, played for the Denver Broncos and won the uh, Super Bowl 50 for the Broncos. Now, some people might say it was because of the Broncos defense that they won the Super Bowl, but he was still the quarterback and he still managed to win the Super Bowl for the Denver Broncos. So. Yes, you can win the Super Bowl after having your, a, a cervical fusion. Another myth is I'll never be able to play golf again and win the Masters. Well, that would be wrong as well because Tiger Woods had his spine fused in uh, 2017. He had an anterior lumbar and body fusion of L5-S1. And two years later, he ended up winning the Masters. Uh, and so he was proof um, that you can play golf and Maybe you can win the Masters, probably not. Um, but you can see the golf swing there on the left. It's a very violent act for the back. Um, and probably the reason why Tiger Woods' back had so many issues. Um, but the fusion that he had was very successful and helped him get back into action and, and win the Masters. Another myth is that you'll never be able to extreme ski again. Well, that's wrong as well. Um, but it's most likely correct because most people can't do what this guy, Candide Thibault, does. Uh, so Candide, if you see that picture on the bottom left, the circle is him flying off a jump. That was The jump was called Big Bertha. Unfortunately, the day he did that jump, it was a little too warm. He didn't make the landing, and he landed right where that guy is standing um, at the bottom of the jump. And he ended up with a burst fracture of his lumbar spine, um, which was treated with a three-level fusion in his lumbar spine. Um, however, I, two years later, he came back and started extreme skiing again. And that's a picture of him hucking a cliff. And this guy is just amazing. If you want to watch him in action, Google Candide DeVoe and then Google Candide DeVoe Audi commercial, and you'll see some impre pretty incredible skiing. Not always on snow as well. So the point is, you can have a spine fusion and return to pretty high level activities. Um, Obviously, if you're not doing high-level activities before your spine fusion, you're probably not going to, you know, end up extreme skiing or winning the Masters. So this is a patient of mine who was um, seeing me as a patient um, while I was preparing this, this lecture, and she kind of fit all the common myths. 
um, that we just went over. She was a 74 year old woman. She ended up with a two level fusion um, through the front um, anterior lumbar and body fusion. She only spent two nights in the hospital and she ended up with full range of motion at, at only three months after surgery. She did very well um, and was quite happy with her surgery. So the, um, just another example of people doing well after spine fusions. Common myth number six, spine fusions will require large incisions with ugly scars. Well, not necessarily. Uh, the neck anterior lumbar, the anterior cervical incisions are usually pretty small, about one and a half inches in length. And we can usually do uh, up to three levels from that small incision. The cervical incisions heal very nicely. Um, and usually they can become scarless. I'm not saying everybody's scarless. It often depends on the person itself, but there's many patients come in and I can't even find their incision after several months. Um, lumbar fusions, sometimes bigger operations, depending on the number of levels, uh, but a one level posterior fusion typically, typically will be about a two inch incision. Um, and they uh, usually heal pretty nicely as well. So the realities, surgery isn't usually the first option, um, but you might ask, well, you just went over why, how great spine fusions are. Why not just make it the first option? Well, the first option, you should always try to avoid surgery um, if we can, you know, doing those things we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, um, conservative treatments should always be exhausted. The reason why is because anything can happen in surgery, even with the smallest operation, um, anything can happen. And you want to avoid, minimize that risk. And by minimizing that risk, we try to avoid the surgery. Um, so, you know, that's my, my motto and my, my theory and philosophy is try to get people to do, get better without needing my services in, in the operating room. Um, spine surgery runs the gamut of techniques and pathologies. So just keep that in mind. It's very difficult to compare patient X to patient Z. Um, most people have different problems and they require different surgeries. Even if we're operating on the same level, there's multiple different ways to, to treat the pathology and um, much, many different pathologies to be treated. So it's, you know, it's very hard, very difficult for someone to compare themselves to another patient in terms of their symptoms, in terms of what their surgeries were, in terms of their outcomes. So keep that in mind. Um, and surgery doesn't come without risk, like we talked about. We always go, I always go over the risk benefit ratio. So what does that mean? The, the risk of surgery um, on one hand and, the, and the, the benefits on the other. So if a patient's having a, a small amount of pain and they can do pretty much whatever they want, they take an Aleve or an Advil every once in a while and you know, their back hurts. Well, that benefit is pretty, the benefit that they're gonna get from surgery is pretty small, but the risks are pretty high. Then there's another patient who has 10 out of 10 pain. They're miserable. They can't do anything. They can't walk more than 100 feet. Well, their benefit's going to be very high, and their risks are going to be the same, but that benefit outweighs the risk. So that's the risk-benefit ratio. And I always have that scale in my head every time I see a patient and, and discussing surgery. Um, and then the risk of adjacent level disease. So one of the main reasons why we try to avoid surgery is because when we fuse one level, the, the levels above or below can go bad. And that's, you know, obviously not a good thing. Um, so there's definitely a, a risk of that happening in the future. And we try to avoid that. Um, and the best way to avoid that is trying to avoid the fusion in the first place. So um, that's always something we discuss and talk about. Motion preservation. So people can, will often ask about, can't you just replace the disc and keep the motion? Well, yes, you can. Um, there are cervical and lumbar disc replacements. However, there are downsides to the disc replacements as well. The, um, the cervical disc replacement is a, a great operation. It, it can be very helpful for people and, and we can preserve some of that motion. However, the indications are, are limited. Um, if you have axial neck pain, it's not a very good operation because it's gonna allow for those joints to keep on moving and if those joints are the pain generators. People are gonna continue to have pain. The other thing that I worry about in disc replacements is that um, when we have motion, a motion segment parts will fail. Um, not saying they necessarily have to fail, but we can have wear of those parts. And when we put a disc replacement next to the spinal uh, cord and something happens in the future, especially 30, 40 years from down the future, then I get concerned. 
Um, so that's my concerns for di uh, disc replacements. Advancements in spine in infusion surgery. So um, like I, we talked about fusions in the past could be pretty brutal. They were long operations, huge incisions um, with fairly, uh, fairly uh, early hardware and screws and rods and hooks or wires. Um, nowadays, we have uh, minimally invasive techniques with special instrumentation that's adapted to those minimally invasive techniques. This is an example of an, a, a cage that I'll put in from the back into the disc space. And you can see it's collapsed on the front. And then I can expand it and open it up like a jack and fill that space very nicely. And it, um, it's a very powerful instrument that I have now. Um, so those are expandable cages. There's a decreased risk in, in failure of those uh, instruments now because um, they're much more advanced um, and it allows for improved outcomes. So that's, you know, it's a great thing that we've had such significant advancements um, in spine surgery in the last 20, 30, 40 years. So just a little warning, bad information. There's a lot of information out there. Um, if you use Dr. Google, um, you're going to get a lot of information and it's important, very important to take a lot of that information with a grain of salt. Um, while I was doing this, preparing this talk, I was Googling a lot to try to get pictures and I went down some rabbit holes and ended up on even physicians' websites. And even the, um, there was bad information on those websites and I was shocked. Um, people using misquoting papers and research articles for their own benefit. And um, it was kind of, it's just be very careful when you start looking on, online and using Google. And I don't think you shouldn't. I think it's you know important to get information. Just be careful um, with how you use that information. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions from the, the crowd. The advice I give to people is to try to get up and move. Um, don't be a, don't be bed bound. Um, motion is key. It, you know, the more you move, the better it's going to get. Um, if you stay still in, in one place, things kind of settle in and you get stiff and painful. So I like people getting up and walking. Um, try to minimize how much pain medications you take if you can, and um, try to get into the light of day. Very good question. And it's actually probably could have been one of my myth slides. Um, you know, people often ask, is there something we can inject into the disc that will replace the disc or pump up the disc? Unfortunately, when we do a, uh, uh, when the disc degenerates and kind of collapses, that disc is, is, has been ruined. Um, it can't get its life back. It doesn't have a vascular, the disc doesn't have a vascular supply. So when something doesn't have a vascular supply, it can't, can't technically heal itself. Um, and anything that we've tried to inject into the disc has failed. Um, there's been many attempts at doing simple injections for the disc and it really has never been proven to be successful. Um, so in terms of your situation with the prior surgery, non-instrumented uh, spine fusion many years ago that didn't take, didn't fuse, and there, you feel like there's more motion um, there won't be a simple injection that will help stabilize that spine. Um, it will most likely need uh, screws or instrumentation. So the question was, if there's intermittent numbness in the hands and toes, um, my take from that is that it's not happening all the time. It's happening off and on. Is it positional? Um, 
Is it temporal or is there a time? Does it happen more at night? Um, there could be a lot of reasons for this, one of which can be the spine. Um, but if it's bilateral and symmetric and both in the hands and toes, it usually tells me that it's probably not the spine. I'm not saying it won't be the spine, um, but it sounds more like a neuropathic process, um, which is more of a neurological assessment. So the question was, would I like to do, would I prefer a disc replacement versus a fusion? It depends on, is it the neck or is it the back? Um, are we treating back pain or leg pain? To be honest, for the lumbar spine, I don't see a lot of indications for the disc replacement. I think the outcomes are, um, in, the surgery is the same. Um, you, it's the disc replacement, you go through the front, um, through the, the, the belly, the abdomen. Um, and we can do that for a fusion as well. The, my problem with the, the disc replacement for the lumbar spine is that you're leaving a big variable, which is a motion segment, um, the joints, if the joints are producing the pain, that those are still gonna produce pain. So I prefer fusions over disc replacements for the lumbar spine. For the disc replacement for the neck, um, if it's strictly radicular pain in the arm and there's no neck pain involved, the disc replacement can be a good option. So the question was, will fusions help with migraines for the neck? Um, so migraines are a certain type of headache. And I often, people come in and say, I have, I have headaches or migraines. And I always try to verify, is it actually a migraine or is it a, something called a tension headache? So the cervical spine can be the source for headaches, but not migraines. Um, but people can get tension headaches, which usually start in the back of the neck and kind of develop and go up in the front of this, the head uh, migraines are a very specific type of headache, which usually in, entail auras and vision changes or sensitivity to light. And a neck fusion will not have helped that. Um, but a neck fusion can help with cervicogenic headaches or tension headaches. I can answer that with one word and yes, <laughs> depends on, but of course it depends on why or what the problem is. Um, but it, an eight year old is not, that's not abnormal um, for spine fusions, um, especially if you're in good health. If you've got the right indication, then it's definitely an option. And if you fail to conserve therapy. Great question. Um, so as anybody that knows me well, my wife would will know what I'm about to say is I think deadlifts are the enemy um, and overhead squats. I don't like a lot either. You know, people that say they do deadlifts with perfect form and there's probably a few people out there that do. Um, but otherwise, I think there's better ways to get do strengthening exercises, avoiding deadlifts. Overhead squats, I don't like is the barbell across your shoulders and it's just a lot of axial weight on your spine. Um, I think there's better things to strengthen your, your glutes and your, your quads and hamstrings. Um, I love low weights, high reps. I love um, Pilates-like exercises, core strengthening exercises. Uh, yoga can be very helpful, staying limber. Um, but static core exercises are my favorite. Not a lot, you know, when people think about strengthening the core, they think about sit-ups and, and crunches. That's a lot of repetitive motion for your spine. Planks, you mentioned, I, I think planks are really good as well. So any of those things, staying, staying healthy and fit is, is the key of avoiding someone like me.
So the question is, does fusion help correct the loss of balance? And yes, it can, um, but it depends on what, why you have the loss of balance. Um, so some people will become kyphotic or they'll lean, start leaning forward um, because they have either fractures or as part of the deforming process or a degenerative process. And that can encourage loss of balance and we, a, a correction of that deformity can be very helpful in helping with that. Um, but if you have a loss of balance because of a something in your brain, obviously spine surgery will not be helpful for that. Some people have loss of balance because they have severe stenosis on their spinal cord or their nerves, and that doesn't allow for their legs to work well. And correcting that can be very helpful for their loss of balance. So the answer is a mixed bag. Yes, it can be helpful, but it depends on why you have the loss of balance.